Welcome to Eggs and Issues, a monthly business program presented by the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Listen weekday mornings to Ken and Matt on the WGAN Morning News. Eggs and Issues is supported by presenting sponsors, Bank of America and Martins Point Healthcare in cooperation with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, First Light Fiber, and Wex. And now, please welcome Portland Community Chamber of Commerce President Jack Lufkin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello, and welcome to Eggs and Issues. I am Jack Lufkin with Key Bank, and I am the volunteer president of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. I want to uh, wish you all a happy new year. Thank you for joining us today. This is, of course, our first Eggs and Issues of 2018, and we're kicking off the season with a fantastic presentation from Danielle Conway, Dean of the Humane School of Law. I do want to note we do have a few dignitaries in the room today. With us, we have Mayor Strimling, Councillor Dusan, and Chief Justice Softly. We thank you and everyone for attending here today. <clears throat> uh, before we get to the program, I do want to take just a minute to share some information and detail about the uh, Portland Chamber, Regional Chamber's annual event and celebration. That's going to be taking place in just a short period of time here, Wednesday, January 24th. Uh, our annual event, which is named Imagine Portland, is not only the Chamber's largest networking event, but it's the largest fundraising opportunity of the year. It is also our chance to honor our annual award recipients, those who have stood up in the community to take on a challenge and those who have made a difference and benefited our region. And today, I have the pleasure of announcing, and you have the pleasure of hearing, firsthand the winners of these awards. They're, they're no secret to the, uh, to the award recipients, but we're, we're, uh, we're gonna announce them here today, and please join us at the annual event to hear more about their uh, fantastic contributions to the region. So our award for leadership in the private sector will be going to Melissa Smith of WEX. She is the CEO of WEX. <laughs> Our leadership in economic development will be given to SIGCO and their CEO, David McElhaney. <laughs> for leadership in the public sector, we'll be pre actually presenting dual awards uh, this year for their incredible work done defeating the uh, November Portland ballot referendums on rent control and zoning. We are going to be honoring Heather Sanborn from Rising Tide and Britt Vitellius of Vitellius Real Estate. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, our Visionary Volunteer Leadership Award goes to a Chamber Volunteer extraordinaire, uh, Michelle Raber with State Farm, past president of the Scarborough Community Chamber of Commerce, just a tireless volunteer. So now that you are in the know, we're actually even going to sweeten the pot for you. Uh, some Come and celebrate these award winners with us on January 24th. It's going to be held at Brick South on Thompson's Point. Uh, and we do want to just take a second to say that this event would not have been possible without the generous support of our vision sponsor, Memic. Um, we do thank them for, for their uh, sponsorships and all of the sponsors. Now, if you have not yet bought your ticket, uh, Nicole from the Chamber staff will be at the front desk after this presentation to sign you up. And as a bonus, anybody who buys their pass today will get a $15 discount. So you can sign up with Nicole directly afterwards. But because we've all been to the auctions and we all know how long those lines can go. So our crack Chamber staff is also going to extend this for the rest of the day today. So if you go back to your offices and want to sign up today for the annual award celebration, and under the promotion code, you put EGGS, E-G-G-S, you will receive that $15 discount. So please do. That is an event that is, is not to be missed. So please sign up for that. So now, I do want to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors for making today's event possible. Uh, our presenting sponsors are Bank of America, and Martins Point Healthcare. Our cooperating sponsors are Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, WEX, and First Light. Our reception sponsors have grown this month. 
I'm sure many of you saw the banner in the hall, but our friends at Verrill Dana have become our newest Eggs and Issues sponsors. I know Verrill Dana is no stranger to anyone in the room, but a little background on the firm. Verrill Dana's enduring commitment to quality client service is complemented by their commitment to community service. They believe that it's a role as that they believe its role as a leading New England business carries corresponding obligation to give back to the communities in which they live and work. This obligation is fulfilled through the personal service of Verrill Dana lawyers and staff in numerous community organizations, the firm's prominent charitable giving program, and the direct provision of pro bono legal services. Thank you, Verrill Dana, for your sponsorship of this program and for all that you do in the community. <clears throat> now, our other reception sponsors include Clark Insurance and Key Bank. Our parking sponsor is CV and Mahar Engineers, and Headlight Audio Visual provides us with our overall production support. Thank you all. The Forecaster is our print sponsor, Main Biz is our e media partner. WGAN is our radio sponsor who interviews our speakers and broadcasts live right here every month. And WMTW-TV serves as our broadcast partner. We also want to thank our special community partners, whom are Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Spectrum Healthcare, the University of Southern Maine, and Southern Maine Community College. AAA Northern New England and Springborn Staffing support our Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs program, which allows area high school and college students to attend eggs and issues. This month, we are pleased to have with us students from Falmouth High School, Chevrolet Academy, and the Maine Girls Academy. If you represent any of those organizations, please rise and let us thank you. Baker Newman & Noyes sponsors our Community Corner program, which allows area nonprofits to promote their organizations at eggs and issues. This month's Community Corner is the American Lung Association. The American Lung Association would like to invite you and your business to participate in their New England cycling events this spring. The trek across Maine is a one, two, or three day ride across the state, uh, starting at Sunday River and ending in Belfast. And I believe everyone at their table has a little brochure on that. So if you're looking to get out of the state of Maine, cycle the seacoast is the perfect option for you. Choose from 25, 50, or 100 miles, starting and ending in Red Hook Brewery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Both events raise vital funds to support the programs and initiatives of the American Lung Association in Maine and New Hampshire. To learn more, search Trek Across Maine or Cycle the Seacoast on Facebook or take the handout located at your table. And staff from the, the association will be here to speak with you in the lobby after breakfast. I would like to welcome from the American uh, Lung Association, uh, Melissa Walden, Development Manager, Lance Boucher, Director of Public Policy, Peggy Poynor, Penor, I'm very sorry, and Rhonda Vosmus, uh, which are, who are our board members, and Rachel Reed for the American Lung Association Leadership Board. Thank you all for, for being here today. As we like to remind folks, we are a membership-based organization, so an important part of our eggs and issues each month is recognizing new chamber members. Today, we'd like to welcome them to the chamber. So I'll read very quickly through them. House of Languages, Maine Imaging, Bristol Seafood, the US Army, and National University. We also have Walton External Affairs, SIGCO, Southwest Airlines, Airwaves of US Cellular, uh, and Mariama's Beauty Supply and Braiding. Welcome to the Chamber. We greatly appreciate your membership in our organization and look forward to working alongside you in the months and years to come. Round of applause for our new members. <laughs> now, on to our presentation for today. I just want to remind folks that we will have a question and answer period after our keynote. And if you'd like to ask a question, uh, there are, I see three microphones at various points throughout the room. We ask that you go to the microphone, tell us your name and your organization before your question. So, Danielle Conway is Dean and Professor of Law at the, Univers at the University of Maine School of Law. She is a leading expert in public procurement law, 
entrepreneurship, and intellectual property law. She teaches in the areas of intellectual property law, licensing intellectual property, international intellectual property law, internet law and policy, and government contract law. Dean Conway has realized the goal of immersing Maine law into the greater Maine community by promoting access to affordable legal services in rural parts of the state creating leadership opportunities for underrepresented students through Maine's Laws Plus program and driving workforce development uh, with new programs, one in regulatory compliance and another in information, privacy, and cybersecurity. She has over 27 years of military service and has recently retired as a rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And we are lucky enough to have her on our Regional Chamber Board of Directors. So without further ado, I would welcome to the stage, Danielle Conway. Good morning. This is a really big deal for me. It's a really big deal for the law school. I thank you so much for being here. So you know, my name's Danielle Conway, but you may not know, I'm the very proud dean of the University of Maine School of Law. I want to thank you for coming out this morning. It's a nice, brisk morning, but I understand it's going to warm up. I did that for you. <laughs> I also appreciate the Portland Chamber of Commerce for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you today about our law school. I serve as a board member, as was stated, alongside University of Southern Maine, President Glenn Cummings, whom I'd like to thank for rearranging his schedule this morning to actually be here to support me. In the spirit and practice of one university, University of Maine System Chancellor James Page is represented by his chief of staff, Jim Thielen. As well, my colleagues serving on the University of Southern Maine senior leadership team are here, and I thank them for their steadfast support. Finally, I would like to thank the entire Maine Law community, students, alumni, staff, administration, members of the Maine Board of Visitors and the Maine Law Foundation Board for their unbridled support of all things Maine Law. So I think now I'm supposed to click, is that correct? All right. The big green, oh, the big one. That's fantastic. <laughs> In a complex network, yet often siloed world, one can easily lose sight of how law operates for the greater good. So much so that I perceive that people question whether law really matters. Before responding to this question, I think it's important to consider how the greater good is defined. One might say that serving the greater good means providing people and businesses access to affordable legal services, especially close to our hearts in rural communities. Others might say providing sound legal advice to parties hoping to enter into a deal is a good thing, or maybe even developing a compliance program for an enterprise operating in a highly regulated industry. That might be for the greater good. In each of these contexts, though, the existence of and the belief in the rule of law and in legal systems are key components of managing relationships. The rule of law and the existence of legal infrastructure provide individuals, businesses, and institutions with certainty and confidence that they will be treated fairly and equitably. So in this context, I answer resoundingly that law does matter. Law has purpose. It has purpose in an organized, civilized society. 
to let us know that there is certainty and stability. Law has power. It has power to protect, to create, to coerce, and to legitimize according to our fundamental core principles. And law is ever present. It regulates the environment that we inhabit, the technology that drives us forward, and the business and personal relationships that we enter. Law also creates trust, a trust between government and citizen, and normalizes behavior for the benefit of a well-functioning and civilized society. So why do lawyers matter? Anyone who has heard me speak over the past two and a half years knows that I have an answer for this question. I have had the privilege of training law students and lawyers at over six institutions of higher education, including schools in Australia, Hawaii, and even as a uniformed service member of the United States Army Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School. In my over 25 years of teaching and practicing, I have a clear understanding of why lawyers matter. Lawyers matter because they defend the United States Constitution. Lawyers matter because they promote the rule of law around the globe. Lawyers matter because they represent the most vulnerable among us. For sure, these are very large concepts, but these concepts can be reduced to their most basic elements. Lawyers matter because we translate and transfer knowledge. We've all heard the saying, knowledge is power. There is no truer statement when someone uninitiated in the law must confront any aspect of the legal system. A lawyer's value is in how she makes law accessible to those who are not members of the legal profession. Lawyers also represent a very important person just yesterday told me that law is one of the helping professions. Consider that when the most vulnerable among us has access to a lawyer and receives fair and equitable treatment, society has just benefited by gaining one more person, one more entity that believes in the rule of law. This belief creates stronger communities, and stronger communities yield stakeholders who focus on achieving prosperity, usually through establishing economic enterprises and seeking growth and progress. Lawyers also stand up. Lawyers are trained extensively on enforcing the rights and protections of individuals and entities, as well as on their obligation to meet extraordinarily high standards of ethics and professionalism. This training fosters a commitment to respond to injustice of any kind. In this way, after tackling these two questions, this one turns out to be the easiest. But I also have to remember that it's easiest for me because I have been brought up in the legal tradition. My hope today is that you begin to see why this is the easiest question. Whether you have graduated from another law school further south, or whether you have not had a direct connection to the profession at all. Maine law matters. It is the public and only law school in the state of Maine. It is unlike any other law school in this nation. 
as it produces lawyers and leaders for Maine. And to its credit, it has never disconnected itself from the substantive needs of its community. I've just returned from the Association of American Law Schools annual conference in San Diego. The AALS is an eligibility-based membership organization of 179 law schools, all of which must be accredited by the American Bar Association Section of Law and Legal Education and Admission to the Bar. They make you memorize that in order to remain a member. <laughs> Maine law meets both eligibility and accreditation requirements. You should be very proud of your law school. But this is not the story. The story is that despite the challenges that face small, relatively young, and relatively less endowed schools such as ours, Maine law is held up by its peers and the leadership of both ALS and ABA as an example of what law schools should be. This recognition is exemplified by the many invitations our faculty receive from these institutions and from our law schools to deliver presentations and workshops as well and intentionally visible my selection as a member on the exclusive Dean Steering Committee comprised of 14 deans directly resulted from Maine Law's work and its partners on behalf of rural communities. Maine Law matters because of what it produces. It produces highly qualified lawyers who recognize their roles as leaders, and it produces lawyers who are connected to their communities here in Maine. This is why I am the proud dean of the University of Maine School of Law. So in just two and a half years, this measure is how we have reimagined what a law school can be. And other schools are catching on to what we already know, that the future of the legal profession rests on how we as lawyers and law schools enrich our communities. This captures the essence of place-based practice. And it leads me to always recognize that Maine Law is the public and only law school that serves Maine by producing lawyers and leaders for our communities. Maine law is not alone in this reimagining. I am honored to have the opportunity to recognize the efforts of Chancellor Page, President Cummings, President Hunter, George Campbell, President and CEO of Maine Center Ventures, for moving the vision of the Maine Graduate and Professional Center from concept to starting gate. These leaders facilitated the various partnerships among the system assets that will work to enhance economic growth and workforce development in Maine. These leaders served as catalysts for creativity and their efforts were recognized by the Harold Alphon Foundation. The Certificate in Regulatory Compliance for Non-Lawyers that I'm gonna talk about today is but one of the standout executive education initiatives to be launched within the Graduate and Professional Center. The Regulatory Compliance Certificate is made possible through a partnership between the Maine Regulatory Training and Ethics Center led by Ross Hickey and Maine Law with substantial startup funding and support provided by USM's main economic improvement fund, headed by Terry Shahada and Chris Sahanchek. So you know what it means to be here talking about these partnerships? Well, in legalese, what it means is we are working on really cool stuff. <laughs> I would have said something different if this were a military audience. So what value do we provide in this wonderful partnership? I'm here to either acquaint you or reacquaint you to what we do up there in that Gothic building. 
as I was listening to NPR this morning, or Maine Public, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mark. Maine Public? Maine Public Radio. I thought it was Maine Public, okay, okay. All right, Maine Public Radio. So they'll edit this in the YouTube video. As I was listening to Maine Public Radio this morning, I heard a wonderful story, and it led into a rap song that I absolutely appreciated the lyrics of. And it says, you cannot teach what you don't know, and you cannot lead where you don't go. Yeah, I like that, thank you, amen. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> That's exactly right. And this is how I feel about the extraordinary faculty at the University of Maine School of Law. Part of our value rests with our professors. Professors do somehow get a bad rap. I'm a professor. Stop giving us a bad rap. We are different than most law schools, though, in that the majority of our faculty come from practice. This is what singularly stands out about our law school. The main law mold is to bring from practice tools that inform our curriculum and our teaching. Just to give you a snapshot, Jeff Main, expert in tax law, practiced in Florida. Lois Lupica practiced bankruptcy law in New York City. Sarah Schindler, state and local government law in California. Dimitri Baum, labor and employment law in California. Christine Davik, IP litigation in Chicago. Jennifer Riggins, right here in Maine, torts and insurance law. And Deirdre Smith, civil litigation partner, law firm here in Maine. If you know these individuals, you can affirm that they are not just Maine law resource people. They don't just belong to the law school. They belong to Maine. They belong to you. And they teach students who go on to do extraordinary work, not only as lawyers, but as business people, opening up small businesses, representing the public sector. We saw Heather Sanborn getting an award from the chamber. They run companies, invent products. They serve me. These are your graduates. As well, their value is in a very important space for us going forward, entrepreneurship and innovation. We produce leaders who are not strangers in this area. Jess Knox, everybody knows Jess Knox. Everybody saw the video where I jumped all over Jess Knox. It was great. If you haven't seen it, go search for it. <laughs> Alongside Jess Knox, a staple in the startup community, we also count Trevor Hughes, president and CEO of the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and a 1995 graduate of your law school. Maine Law has a unique partnership with the International Association of Privacy Professionals, which renders it one of the top programs in Maine. Top programs is right here in Maine for information privacy in the nation at a time when this field is driving parts of our state and national economies. We are also fortunate to have launched a professor of practice program in which legal practitioners having specialized knowledge and a strong sense of volunteerism, emphasis on volunteerism, augment our offerings. One such professor of practice is Peter Guffin, a partner at Pierce Atwood who specializes in information privacy law and manages the firm's intellectual property and technology group and heads the firm's privacy and data security practice. And Maine law has, and something really important to me, value in leadership. Maine Law's alumni are visible leaders in our community. Our alumni are engaged in local, state, and federal levels of government. Maine's Attorney General and Chief Justice, as well as nine state legislators, are Maine Law alumni, and our four of the most recent governors count in our alumni base. Maine Law also has value for diversity. 
Maine Law's Innovative Plus program expands on diversity in the various professions by offering a summer scholars program to members of our community. I'm happy that high school students are represented here because when you enter your first year of college, the second thing you should do is apply to the PLUS program. Most of our students in the PLUS program come from tradition, traditionally underrepresented groups, and our aim is to introduce them to the bench and the bar. These groups include first-generation college students, people of color, career changers, residents of rural communities, and so many more. We created this program in part so that employers in Maine could have a pipeline to a more diverse workforce. I've already discussed how we conceived the certificate and regulatory compliance for non-lawyers through preparation of the Graduate and Professional Center. So now let me share with you what we've gone, why we've gone in this direction. Maine Law is one of the first law schools in the country to offer a certificate and regulatory compliance to non-lawyers. I believe the future of legal education rests in the dissemination of knowledge about the law to a greater, wider audience. The regulatory compliance certificate is a means to provide industry leaders with access to current governance and compliance laws and practices at an affordable cost. This program also works to retain talent by offering professional development opportunities close to home. This was a response to what we hear as the need from employers to have good, sound training at home that their talent can take advantage of. Not only is the regulatory compliance certificate available completely in Maine, it is delivered in an intensive format over the course of a year such that attendees do not miss significant time from the workplace. Employers receive high quality training for their employees in exchange for sponsorships or on a cost per course basis. The classes are held six times a year, meeting half days on Friday and full days on Saturday. The launch year instruction topics include regulatory compliance and introduction and overview, administrative law and regulation, regulatory compliance in the healthcare and research space, employment and human resources, information governance, privacy and cybersecurity, and regulatory compliance in risk management and insurance. This is a boatload of training, and you don't have to get on a plane. All you have to do is go up Deering Avenue. The inaugural regulatory compliance certificate is sponsored by UNAM, the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce, the University of Southern Maine, and MERTEC. The Portland Regional Chamber has invested in this program by offering to its membership two seats in the class. So you should take advantage of that at no cost to yourself if you're a chamber member. So I propose to you that Maine Law's value is in service. It's in service to businesses and industries, banks and corporations, all levels of government, nonprofit organizations, and citizens and residents right here in Maine. This is an important day for us to be here with you, sharing the news about your law school. So other things you should know is that our curriculum has expa expanded this service mission by putting forward a refugee and human rights clinic supported by the Sam L. Cohen Foundation. We have invested resources with partners in the Rural Lawyer Project, where our students go to rural communities and learn about life and leadership in those communities. We have developed the regulatory compliance program that I spoke about. And we are creating opportunities for loan repayment assistance 
to encourage our students to take advantage of these programs. But this is what I am most proud of today. I am most proud that we are able to attract high quality professors of practice like Andy Kaufman, who are committed to directing the efforts of the Regulatory Compliance Certificate Program. He has 40 years at the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, so he is no neophyte. This is the kind of commitment that we have going on at your law school. We need to be on your radar screen. So, because I have been trained by a very new but very good director of advancement, here's the ask. It's not money. It's not money. I told you it wasn't money. I told you. See, I scared you, didn't I? <laughs> My two asks for today. I need you to pay particular attention to your inboxes. I know that's really difficult because I know you get a lot of mail. But there will be a survey that the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce will disseminate on behalf of George Campbell, Main Center Ventures, John Henshaw, on behalf of the Graduate and Professional Center. We are eager to know how to serve you. Please answer the survey. That was less a request and more a direction. <laughs> the other thing, my second ask, we are all over social media at Maine Law and at the University of Southern Maine. We also have a wonderful Twitter uh, handle for one university. Take out your phones. Take out your phones. Take out your phones. Take out your phones and take a picture of that. So you know our Twitter handle. We need you to be in constant contact with us because we need to know exactly how to serve you. Thank you. So now I think it's time for questions. Okay, no questions, bye-bye. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Tony Payne from Memick. And uh, first, as a great example of legal leadership in Maine, you are terrific. Thank you. And Thank you. I would add that there's also other representatives of wonderful legal leadership. But one, as you mentioned, civic engagement <clears throat> is uh, a really extraordinary fellow up front named Jim Irwin. And Jim is simultaneously chairing the Board of Trustees for the University of Maine System, as well as the chair of the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce. And Jim, thank you very much for everything you do. <laughs> Jim is a partner at Pierce Atwood. My question, Danielle, is, um, I believe the greatest challenge we have in Maine is our demographics. You've talked a little bit about the refugee resettlement uh, mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about what the law school is doing and will be doing to bring new Americans to Maine, get them mainstreamed, and get them into our workforce? You know, that's a great question, Tony, and thank you for that. I have to be absolutely honest with you. Um, last night, I heard a wonderful presentation by Spencer Thibodeau, who said that um, the numbers in our uh, immigrant community have risen to, well, people of color community, 8%. I think it was uh, up from 3%. That's an amazing increase. So here's one thing I say uh, in response to your question. When I arrived here, the minute I landed in Maine, 
it seemed like everybody was there at the airport to greet me. So they're here <laughs> because I think I met almost everyone. <laughs> I, I, your, your question leads me to answer this in two ways. Um, we're going to grow our community, uh, particularly in the diverse segments of that community. Maine is a very welcoming place. I felt wel welcome, but there's no question my status has given me privilege. So I would love that those who are new and new Mainers to Maine have the same welcome I had. I had an extraordinary welcome. So that's number one. And then number two, the individuals who are coming here and who are diversifying our communities and our workforce, these are some pretty bright people, as I've found out. Many of them are judges in their own countries, lawyers who stood up, as I mentioned, against human rights violations and were forced to flee their countries. And they deserve recognition for that courage, but also they deserve certification. So one of the initiatives that I'm currently working on, I had a meeting with a funder, currently working on is to try to underwrite two positions at the law school in the entering class for the LLM program so that these wonderfully talented individuals could get a certification in Maine so that they can provide legal services. I need the help of the bar to be flexible in how to certify these professionals once they spend that money to attain that degree. That's the challenge. Did I answer your question? Good morning, Danielle. Mark is here at the Portland Museum of Art. Can you, um, you kind of created a baseline of why we should really appreciate lawyers, which I appreciate. Um, but can you give us an idea of like, what's, describe the vision of Maine Law in 10 years. What, what do you want it to look like? I want it to look like a fully resourced state public institution. <laughs> I want the state to recognize that this is an imperative, and in 10 years, I want this state to be a model of how legal education is delivered and how we support legal services to those most vulnerable in our community. I want to be the leader in that, and I also want our law school to be seen as the law school for Maine, not the law school in Portland. So my hope, my goal, my vision is that every citizen and resident in Maine sees this law school as their law school. Good morning, Danielle. Susan Morris here in Portland. Thank you for being the role model and I am sure a mentor that you are to so many people in the state of Maine. You have me intrigued with this idea of the delivery of law in, um, in rural communities. Um, I love it when there's something in Maine that we can address within our own state and also becomes an expertise that potentially we can export. Um, and you've mentioned Maine as an example of how perhaps rural law can be delivered. I've learned this morning that there's a difference between becoming a lawyer and becoming perhaps certified or being able to deliver legal services in some way. Thank you for enlightening me. So here is where my mind is going. I would like to better understand what is involved in the expertise of delivering to, I guess, education as well as practice to rural communities I'm drawing the analogy to healthcare, right. where we are suffering a shortage of workers, um, and also technology is being used in both the education and delivery of healthcare. 
Um, so I, I can sense your head's nodding up and down. You get where I'm going. Can you help us understand a little bit more about the expertise you see that needs to be delivered and what the potential is moving forward? Sure, and I'm going to preface what I'm about to say by saying my associate dean for admissions will correct anything I say. <laughs> so, you know, you ask a, a lot of questions, and let me try to deconstruct your question because I think ultimately where you're headed is how do we get service providers out in rural communities, and how is that a template for other professional disciplines? And then to back into that, what are the requirements to make sure that those individuals are certified and prepared for that kind of uh, delivery of service? Is that? OK. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So our court system, led by Chief Justice Softly, they, they've actually been leaders in this space. So there, there is the e-delivery of services. Um, conferences for lawyers can be done uh, in uh, virtual spaces. And that is available, but it's not extensively available to non-lawyers. So what we have done, and fortunately through the creativeness of our faculty member, Lois Lupica, we've embarked on these pilot programs to write applications for justice, and Lois calls them apps for justice. And these operate in pilot spaces like landlord and tenant or consumer protection. And so what they do is they try to give digital assistance to individuals who download these apps to create letters of representation for them to actually walk through a dispute with a landlord and tenant. And so unfortunately, we didn't have the funding to make this a course this spring semester, but we're looking to offer it in the fall uh, semester, hoping to get resources for that. Uh, that way we teach students not only how to use the apps to deliver this kind of virtual representation, but we also teach the law students through this project how to actually code so that when they go out to practice, they can actually use their coding skills to develop additional applications along these legal service provision guide, guidelines. So I think also, and then to attach it to the certific certification question, we do as a bar need to look at some models like other states that have paraprofessional certification to see whether those programs would fit within our needs. But they have to be consistent with our high standard of professionalism, ethics, and practice. And so those are the things that have to be worked out with the Board of Bar Examiners and admission to the bar here in Maine. And then finally, uh, we're, we are all in at Maine Law. Right? I, you know, my default answer is like, yes, that's what gets me into trouble with people. It's like, yes, okay, we'll do that. Um, but that's always my default answer because at the end of the day, we have to be uh, really open to progress, especially in the legal profession. And what I can say about the state of Maine is when you go to somebody with an idea, they sort of run with it. And so that's what I've liked very much about Maine. So I think that the other thing I'll say, the last thing I'll say to your question is, I'd really like to work with uh, allied health and public policy. I have this vision of delivering pods of professionals to rural communities. So like they go in a gaggle <laughs> and they set up and there's a, a main street and they operate there on that main street. And they can be actually brick and mortar or they could be roaming, you know, every quarter they could be roaming. So I, I have this great vision of what we can do as professionals. So social work, uh, health services, legal services, psychiatric services, all of these could be delivered in a similar, according to a similar template. Hi, um, I'm Maria Kuhn. I'm a senior at Falmouth High School. Um, and at the risk of sounding too much like a senior, uh, like a teenage girl, you are so awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, I just wanted to ask, what can public high schools do to help Maine Law reach its vision? Okay, so there's an application outside. <laughs> she is awesome herself, right? She went straight there. You know, you know what you can do? Um, you can, first of all, follow me on Twitter, right? Second of all, the, the approach we've taken at the law school is a doors open approach. So I would love to actually come to Falmouth High School. My son is at Falmouth Elementary. I'd like to come to Falmouth High School and talk with you. So, I mean, let's just let's have a, have a talk, have a chat. And I'd love for you to download our application for our pre-law undergraduate scholars program because you're gonna be in college next year. And I'd love for you to be a part of this program. So. Let's, can you invite me to the high school? Okay. And Chevrolet too, do you want me? No, nobody at Chevrolet wants me. And what was the third school? Girls, the, oh, you know I'm coming to talk to you already. February 8th, I think, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. WEX is a sponsor of the Regulatory and Compliance Program. I am so sorry. That's an example of teamwork. <laughs> uh, Dean Conway, first, obviously, uh, thank you. Uh, second, sort of to Jim Tierney, uh, I would like to advocate for a 10-year contract lock-in for uh, Dean Conway at the law school, so anything we can do. <laughs> Uh, in the alumni group. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is what is, can you pick out one lesson that you've learned at some of the other places that you've been that you, uh, if you could accelerate that application of that lesson here in Maine, what would that lesson be that Maine could take and, and sort of grow in whatever area, whether it's specifically law, but culturally, socially, uh, uh, business community, what would that lesson be? That is a, a really good question. I've had a lot of time to actually think about that over the last month as I was visiting other uh, business schools and law schools around the globe to try to bring back some partnership uh, for Maine Law. You know, I, I would like to have a program at our law school that could really entice international students to be here with us. I think it's really important for a small school like ours to have that kind of opportunity. Our students, they're not going to have those kinds of opportunities often to go to another country. So the way that they can get that global experience, um, because we're not resourced for it, is to have those international students come to us. And around the globe, I mean, the mobility of students is extraordinary. Um, I was in New Zealand and I, I've done uh, a lot of indigenous law representation and I'm used to seeing indigenous people around the globe. I was not really ready when I saw a uh, huge uh, community of African students in New Zealand. I was like, wow, this is awesome. And I want in on this. You know, I want them to come here um, because New Zealand is an expensive proposition. So I'd really like to accelerate growth and accelerate our goals to get those students here. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dean uh, Conway, that was amazing. And your uh, remarks about uh, watching your inbox for a survey reminded me that I skipped over a sponsor that is particularly uh, important. Uh, the Portland Public Library is our FMI for more information sponsor. And watch your inbox because we're gonna be sending out through the library <clears throat> um, some information about, uh, uh, about uh, Danielle's presentation. So uh, good, 
good reminder for that. So as always, you can uh, stay up to date by connecting via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, stay tuned to the Chamber's website for a video this morning's eggs and issues. And uh, once again, a reminder that if you sign up for the um, annual award ceremony on the 24th, if you do that today, promo code EGGS, you'll receive a $15 uh, discount. Next month, we're very excited. Uh, we're gonna be welcoming uh, Mark Vogelzang, the executive director of Maine Public, or Maine Public Radio, uh, to the stage. So be sure to register for that one. We do uh, hope you have a wonderful day and rest of your week. Thank you for coming.